Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our May community chat. My name is Bex Hayho. I am the executive director of United and Homelessness with Orange County United Way. Last month during our community chat, we were talking to faith leaders here in Orange County about why it was important to their faith communities and their faith perspective to be involved in addressing homelessness. If you missed that chat, don't worry, you can find it on our Facebook and our YouTube. And a quick little reminder, if you haven't liked us on Facebook and you haven't subscribed to our channel on YouTube, I know, shameless plug, please do so, but that way you can keep up to date with all of the things that we are up to. And you can direct your friends and family to this community chat if they weren't able to tune in. So May, as some of you might be aware, is Foster Care Awareness Month. And so that is why we have invited our guests today. And we're gonna be talking specifically about transition age youth homelessness in Orange County. That transitional age youth gets shortened to Tay. So if you hear us talking about Tay homelessness during the session, we are referring to young adults between the ages of 18 and 24. The last point in time count here in Orange County showed that there were 275 transition age youth, so between 18 and 24, experiencing homelessness here in our community. 42% of those were in some kind of shelter but 58% of those were actually sleeping out on our streets or in cars. Today, I am thrilled to be able to jump into this topic and have a much deeper discussion on this with three experts. I am joined by Justine Palmore, the Executive Director of Stand Up For Kids, Jaime Munoz, who oversees the Extended Foster Care Program for the County of Orange Social Social Services Agency, I can't say that. <laughs> and Chris Simonson, the Chief Executive Officer of Orangewood Foundation. So first, I'm just gonna ask you guys if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and sharing a little bit about your organization. And Justine, I'll come to you first. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Justine Palmore. I'm the Executive Director at Stand Up For Kids Orange County, and we serve homeless youth between 12 and 24. Our mission is to end the cycle of youth homelessness, and we do that through four core services, which uh, are street outreach, mentoring, outreach centers, and housing. Um, and that's a little about us. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Justine. And Jaime, I'll come to you next. All right. Um, happy Thursday, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Jaime Munoz. I'm with the County of Orange Social Services Agency. Um, the Social Services Agency is the largest county um, agency here in Orange County, um, operating at about a thousand, I'm sorry, a billion dollar budget to serve our most vulnerable children, adults, and seniors. And we touch about over one in four residents in Orange County um, through an array of programs, which includes our CalFresh nutritional program, our Medi-Cal public health insurance program, our general relief cash assistance program, our child protective services, our adult protective services, our refugee social services, our um, in-home support services, and our CalWORKs. Um, services. And as Bex mentioned today, I'm going to be speaking mostly about our extended foster care program. Thank you very much. It's good to be with you. Thank you so much, Jaime. And Chris. Hi, everybody. Chris Simonson with the Orangewood Foundation. I'm happy to be here today to talk to you. Uh, Orangewood's been around now 40 years in the county, and uh, our first project was to partner actually with SSA in the county in building the Orangewood Children's Home, an emergency shelter for foster youth. Since that time back in the 80s, uh, we've been expanding our programming to create more services to support youth that are in foster care and also those that have left foster care and are transitioning into adulthood. I'd say about five or six years ago though, we have really broadened out who we serve and uh, we aren't serving exclusively foster youth or former foster youth. Uh, any young person in need can come and access our services, uh, especially our drop-in center, uh, which is uh, a primary resource for Tay youth that are struggling with basic needs 
and potentially experiencing homelessness. So uh, happy to partner up with anyone out there that is serving teens and young adults. Uh, we, we'd love to work with you and your youth. Thank you so much for those introductions. So our conversation today is obviously specific to this group of people experiencing homelessness. And I would love to hear your insights. Um, Chris, I'll come to you first. What is sort of specific? Why, do, why is there a focus on young adults experiencing homelessness? Can you share a little about that? Sure. Uh, so many young adults that are experiencing homelessness have spent time in the child welfare system and, and were foster youth. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of moving around when you're in foster care. And uh, when they turn 18, a lot of them aren't equipped to be out on their own. Um, only two thirds of foster youth graduate high school. So as an 18 year old being out on your own without a high school diploma, it's very difficult especially in Orange County where cost of living is high to be able to sustain yourself uh, long-term. So that's why we see within the first six months of leaving foster care, about 50% of those young people experience some type of homelessness, whether it's couch surfing or true uh, homelessness, sleeping in their car in the streets. So, and the other thing to remember is these young people are still developing as adults. So they, they are still, in that process of learning what it means to be an adult and they don't have the maturity that say a 25 or 27 year old has. So they're not always making the best decisions. And um, so they need a lot of support. And that's where organizations like ours and, and Justine's come in to really help them navigate this path. And um, Fortunately in California now, young people can elect to stay in foster care till age 21 and get some uh, financial assistance with housing. So that has helped, but there are still um, many young people that are struggling with homelessness in our county. And it, it takes all of us to work together uh, to try to solve this. And, and we're doing that with uh, Jaime and Bex and her team and, and others. Thank you, Chris. Um, Jaime, I'm going to come to you to follow up on a couple of things that Chris mentioned. So one of those was just around um, perhaps some behaviors that, that those of us who are a little older may not quite understand, but um, you're the expert here. And so my limited understanding around kind of physiologically how we develop is that our brains aren't fully formulated until we're a lot older. So could you share just a little bit about the impact of trauma? on young people experiencing homelessness. Could you just speak into that a little for us? Yeah, yes, certainly. Thanks for bringing that up um, because um, yes, our brain continues to develop into young adulthood. And so there's always an opportunity to shape that, that brain, our brain. Um, and actually it continues to develop all our life. Um, but one of the biggest impacts of trauma is that it alters our arousal system. And that means how we receive information, how we interpret information and how we respond to it. And so depending on the type of trauma and the impact and, and how much healing has um, um, progressed, um, early on, it could be a very abrupt um, responses. And so some people, for instance, uh, you'll, you'll hear like, you, if you review any records, you'll say like, a hostile reaction or aggressive or assaultive or um, um, uh, what's that, um, um, removed. Um, but those are physiologically driven reactions to information. And so we do have very specialized interventions to help young people and older people um, to learn how to manage um, those um, responses and look at different coping skills. Um, and so that's something we, we, we and we can, we'll speak about it later um, when we talk about some of the youth that um, we work together on. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think it's just important that we highlight for, for this group of, of people 
um, age 18 to 24, there is such a unique set of needs for them that, that are different from other members of the community who are perhaps experiencing homelessness. And so that's why you know, there's this special focus on Tay homelessness that we see happening on a national level. Um, Tay homelessness is something that's looked at, it's tracked um, because there are specific vulnerabilities and needs for this community. Um, and uh, Justine, you're back with us. I'm delighted to be able to see her again. Um, would you be able to share a little about some of the programs that there are in our community for young adults between 18 and 24? Okay. Um, so we have, we have some programming in the county that are specifically for Tay. And so, uh, as far as shelters, there are none um, right now. We have an up and coming uh, shelter with Covenant House um, set to open soon. And um, we have some emergency housing vouchers from the city of Garden Grove that are available to Tay youth specifically. Um, and of course, we're an access point for rapid rehousing for the Tay population. Um, we also have stay process that uh, help with mentally uh, mental illness and specifically for Tay population. And there are agencies that focus on employment readiness um, specifically for that population. Um, and there are other agencies that also serve um, adults that are like SOS, share ourselves and, um, and Okapaka that we work with. Um, but again, 18 to 24 year olds are, are viewed as an adult, right? So um, it's, it's hard to find tailored services for this population. Chris, anything you would like to add to that around um, specific programming and resources for 18 to 24 in our community? Yeah, I would just uh, echo what Justine said. I think people in, at the state and federal level are starting to recognize that this is a unique population that needs more resources. So the, the FYI HUD vouchers that are, uh, we received a couple of years ago, the first initial 25 were great, but now we're starting to see a lot more of those. And um, so that's a great new resource that we haven't had previously in the county. Um, you know, we have four transitional housing sites that are specifically for Tay youth. So those are our resources that are available to any Tay youth that any of you work with. Um, you just need to get in touch with us. Uh, it is great that Covenant House is uh, having a, a shelter for Tay youth opening up. There's also some legislation that actually is getting heard today up in Sacramento, um, SB 234, that would allocate $100 million towards Tay housing specifically uh, if approved. So that could be a tremendous resource for us. Um, so, you know, I, I think there are a lot of positive things happening. A lot of us are working very hard to serve this population right now, but um, the 275 number Bex that you quoted at the beginning of the, of the presentation is, I can guarantee is understated. And because these kids are hard to track down and um, we're, we're probably serving double that number ourselves. So, um, you know, we need to get more data and, and have it be more accurate too, so that the county can get more resources. And, um, and we're all working hard to do that. But uh, I just appreciate everyone that's out there that is working with this population and partnering up with us, like uh, Cap OC and, and others and United Way and the county, because there's tremendous need out there, especially coming out of COVID where these young people have had their employment impacted, which then impacts their housing. And it's gonna be a while before those jobs come back to this population because many times what we saw in 2008 and nine is adults that lost their jobs then slot into the jobs that our Tay youth were previously holding. So there's a trickle down effect there. I will say that we're starting up a workforce development program next month uh, specifically for Tay youth, focused on getting them into trades and careers that don't 
necessarily need college education. So keep an eye out for some information on that from us. Um, we should be launching that in June. Thank you, Chris. And then um, Jaime, I'm gonna to come to you. Chris mentioned FYI vouchers. Um, and I know that you know what FYI vouchers are and I know, but for anybody who is watching and tuning in, can you share a little bit more about what FYI is and what FUP is and why it's relevant to our discussion? All right, All right. yes, thank you, extremely relevant. Um, FYI stands for Foster Youth to Independence program and FUP is Family Unification Program. And what that translates into is a valuable HUD voucher. And these vouchers are specifically for former foster youth or exiting foster youth because of the abundance of evidence that suggests or that confirms um, their vulnerability um, to different vulnerabilities, including homelessness and housing insecurity. And so in some very unique partnerships here in Orange County, um, one with United Way, um, the other with our uh, Santa Ana Housing Authority, we secured last year 25 of these vouchers, right? And so these vouchers are good for three years. And the way Santa Ana Housing Authority works is if they're successful in those three years, then they can enter into the longer term program. And the intent is to really help um, shore these young people up. And uh, our agency, the Social Services Agency, in partnership uh, with Orangewood Foundation, provides um, supportive services um, that strengthen some of the competencies related to successful transitions to adulthood. And we spoke, yes, they are young adults, but because of their lived experiences, things have been disrupted. And so they do need additional supports and specialized supports. And we're looking at how do we expand their network of family and social support that's so essential for resilience? How do we strengthen their education and career outlooks and skills? How do we strengthen their opportunities for employment? How do we strengthen um, their ability to troubleshoot daily activities, whether it's a a neighbor that maybe gets on your nerves or maybe just the shopkeeper who responds to you in a way that you don't appreciate um, and learning just to navigate life like that so that it's more successful and happy for them. Good news is we partnered again with United Way and Santa Ana Housing Authority, 25 more, that's 50 lives that are being transformed. Um, so yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bex, for bringing that up. Boris, it's been um, a joy to be able to work together to help young adults who've received an FYI voucher and an FUP voucher. And, and one of the things that Chris mentioned was, you know, that additional resources have been, have, are starting to be allocated um, for this population. And so there are more FYI vouchers that will hopefully be available to our community. And so um, hopefully over the next year, two years, we'll just continue to see an influx of those resources, which is wonderful. And I just wanna build off one of the things that you mentioned, Jaime. You know, I think back to when I was 18 and I left home and was trying to navigate things. You know, I had the benefit of a, a support network. I had the benefit of um, having family members that I could turn to and, and just re recognizing that for, for the young adults that we're talking about, they're often without that. And so the importance of the work that each of your agencies are doing. Um, yeah, and I saw so you unmuted. So did you want to jump in there? <laughs> Um, yeah, and, 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 and so I've been in child welfare services for over 30 years. And if you were to say, um, hi, Mitt, what is that one defining strength? If you only had money for one investment, what would it be? And it would be for building um, connections um, from the get-go. Um, I think may, many of us may um, take for granted that the majority of us have 300, 350 connections right? Um, and our foster youth, we ask him if they have one connection, because it's been so disrupted 
Um, and so that's, an, and, and, and we know with an absolute truth, whether it's me speaking or whether it's the University of Chicago who's been following this research, um, that without a doubt, the more connected a young person is, the more favorable their life outcomes are. And that's realized in concrete ways, such as housing security, um, life outlook, uh, if they're parenting, more successful parenting, um, a whole bunch of stuff. So yeah, that's a, a very important area. Thanks. Thank you. And so talking of connections and the difference that they could make, I, I was wondering, did, did each of you have perhaps a story of somebody who's come through one of your programs that you might like to share? And Justine, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure, I have um, a, a young lady that I worked with personally. Um, the, day she, the day I met with her, she came into one of our centers in Huntington Beach and she said she didn't need any help. She was there with her friend and her friend needed help. But she ended up uh, over the course of three years, she ended up um, with us needing services. And so she was a DACA recipient. Her DACA had expired. Um, she had been on drugs. She was trafficked. She was referred to us by her treatment facility, actually, um, and she had brought the girl in. Um, she had no family in California and she couldn't work in the US and our program, one of the criteria is that, that we get them to self-sufficiency within 90 days and they start working and um, she wasn't able to work. So it was an exception to our programming that we took her in, right? We didn't wanna see her in the street. Um, so we housed her and we helped her with her DACA renewal and um, that was granted. We put her through our Project LEAD internship program is a, a working paid stipend to learn leadership skills in one of our outreach centers. She ended up running our outreach center as an assistant to the program manager. And she did that during probably six months. Um, she ended up uh, as an advisory board member. To this day, she's on our advisory board. She represents our youth voice. She um, has been sober for four years and she now works as our outreach coordinator um, in our Costa Mesa offices. She's married and she's planning for her first child. So, you know, someone that had no hope and she didn't know how she was gonna work, pay rent and eat um, to just listen to me today and that helps, right? And so we listened. We, we walked alongside her and things worked out really well. So that's the kind of work that we do. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that powerful story. Um, hi, May, anything come to mind for you? Uh, yes. And so I'll start with where she is now. She's a 21 year old young lady. She is caring for her two small kids two and three, um, she's completing her high school education and they're living together in an apartment um, that was secured through one of the FYI vouchers and in a unit that is part of the network of United to End Homelessness. And she's able to lean on an exceptional support base she can lean on her on Orangewood Foundation. She can lean on this voucher that she will have, so there's no um, uncertainty about her housing. Um, she can lean on her nurse. She's part of the Nurse Family Partnership, which is an in-home visitation program um, um, for parents with young kids. Um, she can lean on her mentor. She has a mentor through Mariner's Church. Um, the Social Services Agency has a large partnership with our faith-based community called Faith in Motion, and Mariner's Church um, offered her uh, a mentor who she leans on when times are good and when times are a little difficult. Um, and she can lean on CalWORKs. Um, and so that's a great place. Um, but she didn't come from a great place. She came from some dark moments. Um, she came to need foster care when she was 17 years old. Um, her parents um, 
had trouble with substance use and incarceration. And she didn't have any family or family friends that were able to take care of her. So she came into foster care. And just like um, the young lady that Justine uh, mentioned, she um, had also been trafficked. So it was quite a, a, a lot of experience to, to try to uh, digest. Um, she came into foster care. She had an exceptional social worker. For three years, the social worker stood by her side, assembled a specialized treatment team to support her. She, you know, with trauma, you go forward and back, forward and back, forward and back. Um, this social worker asked her to just give me some words. She, and she said, um, let me see if I can find it. It says, I've witnessed her um, being in a homeless cycle, but I've also watched her exercise her voice, advocate for herself, be resourceful and provide care for her children. Um, and so it reminds me a lot of, um, I, I love this artist, her name's Sister Corita. Um, and she has this artwork that says, flowers grow out of dark moments. And indeed, um, Sister Corita is correct um, with this young lady. Thank you so much for sharing that, um, and for just sharing that so eloquently. Um, Chris, do you have a, a quick story that comes to mind? Sure, yeah. Uh, we had a young man several years ago who his senior year of high school, he was living in a park and he, he heard about our drop-in resource center. So came by, wonderful young man, uh, always pleasant, willing to help out the staff, you know, with serving lunch or anything that needed to be done. And unfortunately was battling with some substance addiction issues and um, it really turned his personality uh, a complete 180 and he was more combative and struggling with that. And it got to the point where, you know, our staff had to let him know that, you know, if you're gonna be disrespectful and you're gonna be um, talking to us like this, you know, we can't have you here. So he really caused some, him to think about, you know, his path. And he talked to his sister who convinced him, look, why don't you get some help for your addiction? And so um, our staff got, found him a sober living uh, house, uh, celebrated his 30, 60, 90 day anniversaries with him. And he made it through the program and came back just a completely different person, even looked physically different. Um, and so, Fast forward to today, he is living in Escondido. He has his own apartment. He's managing a Papa John's pizza as the manager of the store. And he bought himself his first car and he's building up a savings account. And he told us, he said, you know, it's nice that um, in my job, I can actually now give out pizza to a homeless person that comes by the store and that person used to be me, but now I can give back in a small way. And he's uh, dedicated to, as he, you know, becomes more successful, giving back to people that um, are in the shoes that he used to be in. So. Thank you, Chris. Another wonderful story around impact and the power of connections. And I know in the, in the chat box here on Zoom and also on Facebook, there are links provided to all of your organizations. So if anybody watching and listening wants to get involved and learn more, please follow those links to learn um, and get engaged. And just a huge thank you to our guest speakers today and to everybody who joined in. Our next chat is gonna be on Thursday, June 24th. And I'm really excited to let you know that we have the Director of Public Policy and Affairs from the organization True Colors United, who are a national organization. Um, so really thrilled that Dylan's going to be joining us to continue our conversation around youth homelessness um, and looking at, in particular, the LBGTQ community um, among uh, young adults experiencing homelessness. So really looking forward to diving into that a little deeper then. Um, for anybody who's joining us on Zoom, there's going to be a little survey that will pop up that we would love your thoughts on to help us continue to improve our community chats. Um, until next time, 
uh, please feel free to subscribe and follow us on social media. And again, Jaime, Justine, Chris, thank you so much for your insights and for being with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.